for the promised land now you've been down too long get ready we're about to sing a new song put a smile on your face oh however dark your night joy coming in the morning and everything is gonna be all right And you can't even pay your rent Oh, when those bills are due And you don't know what you're gonna do Hey, just remember this But don't you worry, just free your mind He may not come when you want him But surely keep finding time Everybody's changed Oh, do I have a witness? Does anybody know that joy? It's coming in the morning you be sick, you feel dropped through Trust in the Lord, it's gonna see you through It's gonna be alright Even though we have to cry sometimes I know we can endure for night Cry sometimes Hold on till the morning Let me hear you say joy. joy. It'll make you feel better if you just shout joy. joy. I know it's coming in the morning. In the morning. Oh, oh, shout joy. Oh, and when those bills are due, shout joy. And when those friends turn their back on you, shout joy. Shout joy. Joy. Yeah, joy. 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 Rich dude, the life it is too. I'm all out of options now. What I'm going to do? I'm through. I can't cope. Feels like there's no hope. Bill collectors keep on calling and yelling. I'm dead broke. Wake up. I can see the sun peeping through the clouds now. I knew the Lord was going to make a way somehow. Check me out in the morning. Keep your head of joy. Coming in the morning. I know it's a lot going on in your life right now. And your pillow's been wet with tears uh, Because you've been crying all night long uh, And you can't see your way through Listen, we got a message for you Tell them, Philip, come on Pack your bag We are ready to begin our lectures here This evening Good to see everyone We're marching to Zion <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Let's sing songs of Zion to God. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne and the surround the throne we're marching to zion beautiful beautiful zion we're marching upward to zion the beautiful city of god let those read Refuse to sing who never knew our God, but children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys. Oh, you know we're marching to Zion. Say beautiful, yes, we're marching upward to Zion, yes, the beautiful, yes, you know we're marching, yeah, 
Yes, is that a beautiful, beautiful sight? Every day we're marching upward. Oh, the beautiful city of God. Amen. Let us bow. Heavenly Father, we come to thee right now. Giving you thanks and giving you all the honor and the glory. Yes. Father, we know that we are nothing without you. Amen. Father, we pray that you shower your blessings tonight. Yes. On these men of God and everybody that is present, everybody that is listening, country wide. Father, just be with us this day that we do the things pleasing and acceptable and are holy and divine sight. We lift you up the way we ought to. Amen. Father, we are glad and hold you in high esteem. Father, we're glad that you are our Father. Yes, yes. Amen. Lord, you didn't have to do what you did, but you did, and we want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Send your darling son to hang up on that cross of Calvary. We may be able to enjoy these privileges which we enjoy today. Amen. Father, we go to the furtherance of this service. We pray that you, we lift you up. Yes, yes. We lift you up the way that you are pleasing and acceptable to you. In the name of Jesus. We ask it all. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, I'm the MC. That means that you just in charge for a little while. Uh, so I'm not going to get it twisted, but we are going to go accordingly to the program. And we just uh, blessed tonight. And we've been blessed all day long. All night, the night before, and the night before, and the night before. So God is in the blessing business. Amen. For you that don't know who I am, my name is Brother Martin King. I'm the minister there in Longview at the Union Church of Christ. Been there for 30 plus years, so just pray with me and pray for me. And not only that, but I'm here to do a job tonight. And uh, we know that these men are going to make my job real easy. <laughs> Uh -huh. they, know, they know each other and it's a blessing. But you know, brother, brother George Williams Sr. has been there in the city where, y'all know where he's been, hey? Austin, I thought you knew, I thought you knew, for a mighty, mighty long time. And I'm gonna walk down here, give me a second. Who he is, is that all right? Yes. And been at East Side, four zero. Yeah. yeah. Forty yeah. years. Yeah. That ought to be recognized. Yes, it is. Let me tell you something. He's got education. He got education. He got education. He got AA. He got BS. He got MS. And he, oh man, he got them all. So that tells you right there. But one thing you do have is the B-I-B-L-E. And we're glad. Married, wife, Gil, Gil, and four children. And boy, I know his chest is stuck out now. I know, you know, it's, it's, it's a minister's dream to see his son. Not only sitting beside him, but standing up for the same call. But not just that, not just that. What, what, what's going to really bless him tonight, what's going to bless him tonight is them four grandchildren. Talk to her. Uh, that, that's where he really smiling. And, and I oftentimes say this when you get older as a minister. But we're going to see Brother George Williams Sr. tonight. He can still strut his stuff. But one thing about it, when you get older, stand up. George Williams Jr. Yes, sir. Did you start seeing your stuff strut? Amen. <laughs> you go to that. Now, come on, sir, 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 sir. Yeah. I was under Brother Williams' ministry for years. And I'm happy to see them tonight. Yeah. Brother Mike. Man, yes, sir. Woke up this morning with my mind on Jesus. Can we sing that? 
Yeah, I woke up this morning with my mind It was set on Jesus You know that I woke up this morning with my mind I know that it was set, set on the Lord You know that I woke up this morning with my mind Stayed on, set yeah. Sing it, hallelujah, hallelujah Hallelujah. Woke up this morning. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on. Yes, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on. You know that I've woke up this morning with my mind stayed on. to be praised is his name from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same the Lord's name is to be praised I'm delighted to be here tonight and I don't know when my time starts I hope it starts after I do these preliminaries yes, sir. amen I hope they're giving that much grace um, but I am so thankful to the North Tennessee Hard Church of Christ and the East Texas Brethren for hosting this lectureship and it is a monumental task to do this so we appreciate you very much for doing it and I have not been able to attend every lecture but those that I have heard have done a wonderful job yes. and uh, I'm appreciative just to be on the same program with these great men of God and uh, Brother Kendall has done a wonderful job spearheading uh, this where's Brother Rav I don't see him is, is are you in here I don't see him, but nevertheless, I would say let's give him a hand because he's done a wonderful job at all of the brothers in this area have just done an outstanding job in putting together this marvelous lectureship. And I hope and pray that God will use me tonight to share a thought or two with you that I pray will help us to be better. I'm not trying to impress anyone. I'm, I'm way past that. I'm, I'm, I'm looking to retire. I'm not looking for a church. And that's for certain. But I am glad that my son is coming after me. Lord have mercy. When I heard that he was on the same program, I said, son, are you going before me or after me? And I thought I was going after him. And I said, they have lost their mind. I, I don't have that kind of energy. I don't have that kind of energy. I'm, I'm just going to start, try to start a little fire and let him just set it on fire. But uh, I do want to say this honestly. I told my son, I said, now, they gave me a, a, a meat subject, the fear of the Lord. They gave me a meat subject and bread time. 
Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? This is a meat subject and it takes time to cook meat. Amen. The fear of the Lord. That's over 300 times in the Old Testament. The fear of the Lord. Lord have mercy. Anyway, Virgil, good to see Virgil. We miss him down in Austin. He's one of our song leaders that left us. But anyway, we appreciate him for leading the songs tonight. And my brother Keen, where's brother Keen? Wonderful. I just love that brother. I've known him for many years. Just a good, solid, strong man of God. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Now, I'm going to be talking out of the text that was assigned me, Nehemiah chapter 5. Nehemiah chapter 5. I am a textual preacher. Yes, sir. So one of the things I have to do is at least help you to understand what a word means in its context. And then I can talk about what it means everywhere else. But at least I have to deal with the context. So we look at Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 14, and down through verse number 19 is the text that they gave me. And I'm reading from the New King James translation. Moreover, of the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year unto the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the governor's provisions, but the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them bread and wine, besides 40 shekels of silver, Yes, even their servants bore rule over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Indeed, I also continued the work on this wall, and we did not buy any land. All my servants were gathered there for the work, and at my table were 150 Jews and rulers, besides those who came to us from the nations around us. Now that which was prepared daily was one ox and six choice sheep, also fowl, were prepared for me. And once every 10 days, an abundance of all kinds of wine. Do not get happy on that. Yet, yet in spite of this, I did not demand the governor's portions of provisions because the bondage was heavy on this people. Remember me, my God, for good according to all that I have done for this people. The subject that was assigned to me is the fear of God, a missing virtue in the world and in the church today. I'm going to try to stay close to my notes. I know I have more notes than time. So I'm going to try to stick as close as I can to these so I won't veer. The subject that I have been assigned, the fear of the Lord, is one of the most critical subjects in the Bible. In fact, it is so critical that the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 9 and verse number 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. In wisdom literature, this is what is known as synonymous parallelism. Synonymous parallelism is when the first clause and the second clause in a verse express the same thought in different wording. And each clause illuminates the other clause. For example, the fear of the Lord would be parallel to knowledge of the Holy One and the beginning of wisdom would be paralleled to understanding. Fear and knowledge are equal and wisdom and understanding are equal. So what Solomon is saying is that true knowledge of God will result in understanding who God is and how we are to relate to him in every facet, in every aspect of our lives. And when we understand who God is and how we are to relate to him, our lives will be directed by wisdom from above. Amen. To state it in another way, the prerequisite to gain in wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Or the fear of the Lord is the starting point of our education in every facet of life. 
What that tells me is that as we teach our children their ABCs, we need to also teach them the ABCs of what it means to fear God. Amen. And maybe if we start teaching them their spiritual education with the fear of the Lord and learning what it means to fear the Lord, Amen. maybe they won't leave the Lord when they leave the house. Maybe they won't leave the Lord as soon as they encounter and entice in the enticing allurements of the world. And maybe they won't leave the Lord when they are challenged with the disappointments and difficulties and challenges of life. Amen. And when we baptize new converts into Christ, maybe if we start their spiritual education with what it means to fear the Lord, Amen. maybe they won't be drawn back into the world as soon as they exit the church building. Maybe they won't leave the church as soon as they find out that everybody in the body ain't ought to be like they ought to be in the body. If y'all don't mind me saying that everybody in the body does not fear the Lord. The point is, the fear of the Lord is the anchor for the soul. It is the foundation for a well-rounded, well-lived life. It is the basis of living a life that is well-pleasing to God. Just listen to a few of the texts that talk about the fear of the Lord. I don't have time to exegete these, but you'll get the point. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 27, The fear of the Lord adds length to life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 27, The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a man from the snares of death. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verses 12 and 13 Although a wicked man commits a hundred crimes and still lives a long time, I know that it will go better with God-fearing men who are reverent before God. Yet because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse number 13, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole of man, or this is the whole duty of man. Job chapter 28 and verse 28. The fear of the Lord that is wisdom and to shun evil is understanding. My point is the concept of the fear of the Lord is one of the most important concepts for us to grasp in the Bible. The Bible says that where there is true knowledge... That is where, rather, true knowledge starts. It starts with the fear of God. That's where true knowledge and wisdom starts. It starts with knowledge of God, which is fear of God, as we're going to see as we go through this text. And as we shall see, the fear of God covers every aspect of our lives, every decision of our lives, and every relationship in our lives. There is no part of our life that the fear of God does not touch and does not cover. But the question is, what does it mean to fear the Lord? That is the question. What does it mean to fear the Lord? When we look at the text, when we look at the text that was assigned me, we're able to see how the fear of the Lord looks within the context of everyday life as we relate to all social classes of our fellow man. Now, I, as I said, I've got to teach the text. And I have to have you to understand that in this text, it has a meaning. And in this text, it has to do with how we relate to our fellow man at, in every aspect of life as it relates to justice and fairness. Watch this as we look at the text. Nehemiah chapter 5 is in a unique place. It is uniquely situated in the book with its proximity. When you read the book of Nehemiah, you come to understand that Nehemiah chapter 5 is like a sandwich. Chapter 5 is the meat between the bread. And chapter 4 and 6 are different because we're going to see what it means within the context of this chapter what it means to fear God in chapter 4 there is a conflict from the enemies watch this now in chapter 4 there is conflict from the enemies without Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites and the men of Ashdod are planning to attack the children of God who are working on the wall of Jerusalem and in Nehemiah chapter 6, 
Sambalat, Tobiah, Gisham, and the rest of Nehemiah's enemies are trying to entice him to come down from the wall so that they might destroy him. But when we look at chapter 5, the conflict is not from without. The conflict is on the inside. To modernize this, to modernize it, this time it is not the world that's giving the church the problem. This time it's the church that's giving the church the problem. In Nehemiah chapter 4 and 6, the world is on the outside of the church. But in chapter 5, the world is inside the church. Why? Because church folk are acting just like those on the outside of the church. And the reason that they are acting like those on the outside of the church is that the church folk don't know what it means to fear God. Listen, listen if you will. Listen if you will. Listen to the passage. You're going to see what I'm saying. Watch this now. We are in Nehemiah. Listen what it says now. He says, now the men, and this is chapter 5, now the men, the beginning of it, verse 1, now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers. Some were saying, we are our son, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields and our vineyards and our homes to get grain during the famine. And I'm reading from the NIV. Still others were saying, we have had a, to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our countrymen, and though our sons are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. When I heard their outcry and their charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, watch this now, you are exacting usury from your own countrymen. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have bought back our Jewish brothers who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your brothers only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. Verse number nine. So I continued, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the approach of the reproach of the Gentile enemies? Verse 10, and I and my brothers, this is still dealing with the fear of the Lord. This is still dealing with it. Watch now. I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. But let the exacting of usury stop. Give back to them immediately the fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the usury. You are charging them the hundredth part of the money, grain, new wine, and oil. In this context, the fear of the Lord had to do with what is morally and ethically right in the sight of God. And it had to do with how we behave, watch this, in our manner toward others, especially in the house of God, in the presence of the world. Watch this now. Does how we behave bring honor and glory to God as we deal with one another in the church and as we deal with one another or others outside of the church. If our behavior does not bring honor and glory to God, then we are not fearing the Lord. Fear of the Lord in this context means, watch this now, fear of the Lord in this context means to do what is just, what is right, what is equitable to your fellow man. And get this now, this is very important, don't miss this now, because this is critical. Everything that is legally right according to man's law may not be ethically right and morally right according to God's law. Are you listening to me? You see, man's law allowed these elite wealthy Jewish nobles to charge their brethren interest and to even confiscate their land. These wealthy capitalists confiscated the land of their own brethren by the laws of the land. 
They have a right to do it. But the fear of the Lord won't let you take advantage of your brothers and sisters in Christ. The fear of the Lord won't let you mistreat, take advantage of any man or woman in any circumstance. The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord in this text has to do with, watch this now, functioning according to God's standards in all of our dealings, in all of our relationships, in all of our affairs with our fellow man. Let me take this and put it on a practical level. On a practical level, the fear of the Lord makes you an honest businessman or businesswoman. The fear of the Lord makes you pay your honest debts. The fear of the Lord won't allow you to owe your brothers and sisters in Christ. Look at them every week and act like you don't owe them. If I could just get back some of the money that folk owe me in the church, I would have some money in the bank. Folk know they owe you and look at you. How you doing, Brother Williams? And it's been years and they still said, how you doing, Brother Williams? I'm not asking you for what you know you owe me. But watch this. The fear of the Lord won't allow you to take another man's wife. Fear of the Lord won't allow you to take another woman's husband. The fear of the Lord won't allow you to mistreat your brothers and sisters in Christ and not seek to make right what you did wrong. Nehemiah said, how much time? How much time? I'm good. Wonderful. I saw paper moving. I saw paper moving. I got nervous. <laughs> All right. Nehemiah said to his fellow rich Jews, Jewish brethren, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? Now, when we look at the immediate text that I was given, that's the context overall. But now when we look at the immediate text, I want you to see how fear is used. Watch this now. Verse number 14. Moreover, from the 20th from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah until the 32nd year, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. But, watch this now, the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. They, their assistants also lorded over the people. But, out of reverence, out of reverence, out of fear for God, I did not act like that. Watch this. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table, as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nations. Each day, one ox six choice sheep and some poultry were prepared for me and every 10 days an abundant supply of wine and all kinds in spite of all of this I never demanded the food allotted to the governor because the demands were heavy on these people remember me in your favor O Lord my God listen here in this text fear reverence of the Lord in this text has to do with the fair treatment watch this now of others but this time it means more than just fair treatment of others this time in addition to the fair treatment of others it involves the benevolent treatment of others oh, oh, watch this now in other words the fear of God also encompasses the concept that when God has richly blessed you with more than you need the fear of God says that you look for others who are not as well off as you are, who are in need, and you help them out. Ten minutes, Lord have mercy. I'm still on the bread. Hear me well, hear me well, hear me well. Don't you remember James said, how can you see your brother in need and say, I'm praying for you? 
did not John say, now, now, if you see your brother and sister in need, and you say, well, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm going to close my heart to you. Yeah. How does the love of God dwell in you? Don't you understand that those two texts in the New Testament are magnified this text in Nehemiah chapter 5. That's Nehemiah fear of the Lord in James and in John. Are y'all with me? I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to cut out here. <laughs> Nehemiah knew God's concern for justice, compassion, and equity for all of the people. And it motivated him not only to treat all men right, but also to be benevolent toward those who were in need. Yeah. You cannot be well off. I see your brothers and sisters struggling. You find somebody trying to pay their light bill. And your pockets are running over. And instead of you going in your pocket to help them, you take them to the church to help. Nehemiah said, I didn't do that. Nehemiah said, it came out of my own pocket. I could have accessed government funds, but I chose not to do it. Are y'all with me, church? Now, there are two aspects I want to close with here about fear. Let me talk about the fear of the Lord before I close. The Hebrew word is yethre. I'm not a Hebrew speaker. I have taken Hebrew, and I'm still struggling with the words, how to pronounce them. But don't worry, since none of us speak it, we're okay. Yeah. All right? <laughs> All right, now, now what, it, what it primarily means, get this, is our reverence, respect, wonder, and amazement that ultimately evokes in us a spirit to worship. When you truly fear God, worship is what you want to do. It is not what you have to do in the sense of a burden. Now, you have to do it because it is evoked. So you can't help yourself. Are y'all with me? Now, watch this now. But there's another part of it. It means dread and, dread and trepidation. But I want to just look at this concept of fearing God in an awesome way. I'm careful how I use the word awesome. I don't like to say too many things are awesome because I understand that when I talk about God is awesome, that's something reserved for God. But watch this now. The fear of God in this aspect means to recognize the power and the position that God occupies that forces us, not in the sense of against our will, but because we understand who God is, we cannot help but bow down before him because we understand that I'm not dealing with my equal. This fear of the Lord has to do with understanding who God is. We recognize him as the I am that I am. The always existing one, self-existing. How much time? Five minutes? Okay, good. I'm good. I ain't going to get all of it, but I'm going to get this in and I'll quit. It is me understanding. Watch this now. I'm bringing all of this to you because you need to understand that when I fear God, I see him in all of his glory. As much as I can see him in his glory. He is the one who has always been and has never not been. The omnipotent, all-powerful one. The one that says, there, is there anything too hard for the Lord? The omnipresent everywhere at the same time one. The one who never has to go anywhere because he's already everywhere at the same time. The omniscient one who already knows everything and is never in the dark. Never not in the know. Never need to be informed and never can learn anything because he already knows everything. The one who is, listen, the one who is so unquantifiable that he cannot be measured. He cannot be weighed and he cannot be limited. The one who is so undefinable and indescribable that we have to use words like theophany. We have to use words like anthropomorphism. We have to string together metaphors and images just to get a glimpse of his glory. Ezekiel said the likeness of the appearance of his glory. When Ezekiel saw his glory, he says, I can only get three, deg three degrees clock from his glory. His glory is so marvelous that I can only get three degrees from it. Are y'all listening to me? 
He is so awesome that he told Moses, you can't see me and live. He said, now nah, what I'm going to do is put you in the cliff of the rock. And as I pass by, God does not have to pass anywhere. But he's trying to relate on our level. As I pass by, I'm going to put my hand over you so you can see the hinder part of my glory. The only thing you can stand is the backside of my glory. Are you listening to me? The one who is so incomprehensible that we are not able to explain him. Are you listening to me? He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. The one who has created this world simply by speaking into nothingness and making nothingness become somethingness. The one who is so far above what he created. The Bible says he has to stoop to look on the heavens. Hallelujah. The one who can speak to the wind, command the waves, direct the lightning, shake the mountains, open the skies, plumb the depths of the sea, and ride on the wings of the heavens. When I see him like that, I say, When I see him like that, there's something in me that says, I got to bow before this creature. Before this being, I've got to bow before him because that's our. I know my time is up. But I want you to understand I left a whole lot on the table. Let me tell you something. When you see God in his glory, you do what those Jews did. Watch this now. I'm going to tell you. When, when God opened the Red Sea and they came across on dry land, the Bible tells us, you read it, Exodus 15. The Bible tells us, go on to chapter 14 and 15, you'll see that the Bible says that when they saw the bodies of those Egyptians lying on the shore, that they feared God. They reverenced God. And then in the very next chapter, Moses broke out into a song of worship and praise. And all of Israel broke out into a, a song of worship and praise. Am I right about it? When you see the glory of God, the power of God, you bow down and you worship God. You want to know why? You want to know why we hurry in, hurry through, and hurry out? Talk to us. Talk to us. Huh? We come to worship, we, re re we hurry in, brother. We get there just before the, we, the, the first song. Then we hurry out. Can you hurry up with that sermon? Yes. And then we hurry out. Yes. And we never have any change in our lives. Yes. The reason why we're so caught up in time is because we don't fear God. Yes. I don't have time for the rest of it. King, the other part of it, the other part of it is our, in the sense of fear, reverential fear that says, I understand who God is and that God can distract me if he wants to. Yes. You remember when smoking Mount Zion was smoking and shaking and quaking and the people said, yes, we are afraid. Yes, Moses, you talk to us yeah. because we can't stand the voice of God. And Moses said, yes, God is coming. He came to test you so that you might know to fear him. That's that fear that understands that God can, if he desires to, wipe me out. But here is the wonderful thing. As I go to my seat, we don't serve a capricious God. We don't serve a fickle God. We serve a God who is long-suffering, full of love and compassion, slow to anger. Are oh, y'all listening to me? Jonah said the reason I didn't want to go to Nineveh is because I knew that's the kind of God you were. That's a gracious God. So if God were just waiting to pull the trigger on us to strike us down, all of us would be dead now. Thank you. God bless you. Brother William to preach that been preaching the, that long. He's reached the era of my mentor. If I could just get my mentor to the pulpit and he grab a hold of it, he go to work. So we got him a hold of it today, tonight, and he went to work. I told you he could strut his stuff, didn't he? Amen. Now we get ready to see this stuff strut. Amen. Amen. Brother Michael Wee. Preaching at Missouri City for six years. 
we were going to have some singing, right? There they are. There they are. Okay, we'll get to Brother Mike here in a minute. Y'all come on up. That's WTC. Come on. Amen. Amen.
us encourage them to keep on keeping on. Amen. Wherever they go, wherever they live, must encourage them. Now, getting back to okay. at hand. Yes, sir. All right. Now we want to see Brother George Williams Sr. see his stuffed strut, which is Michael Williams. He's been preaching at Missouri City for six years. Been in the ministry 21 years. I think he done cheated on his birth certificate because it don't look like it's 21. But anyway, uh, graduate of Southwestern Christian College of Bachelors of Religious Studies. And his wife is Leslie. Have three boys. Amen. George Michael III, Harrison and Silas. Amen. Thank goodness I got his children named right, but I don't like to have nobody kids named the boy, boy, boy. But anyway, we are going to loose the man of God. We're not going to hold him long. We're going to let him go. Like we said earlier, and he, he, he need to follow the footsteps of his daddy. His daddy has stayed within 30 minutes. God bless. Yes, sir. Uh, Y'all ready? Yeah. <laughs> in my vein, is in my vein. Church is in my vein, is in my vein. Tell me why the blood is running warm, is in my vein, yeah. War is in my vein. Is in my yes, is in my veins. Tell me why the blood is running. I know that it's in my veins. Yes, well, sometimes I'm gonna sing just a little lower. Anybody wanna sing just a little lower? Tell me why the blood. Tell me why the blood. Tell me why the blood is running warm, is in my vein, yeah. Good to be in God's house on this Tuesday night to worship our awesome God in spirit and in truth. Amen. And we are just appreciative to uh, this Texas State Lectureship uh, Committee for putting on an awesome uh, lectureship this year. And uh, it has already been done, but let's uh, give Brother Kennel and all of those that have put this together a round of applause for an awesome job. Just appreciate uh, them. Appreciate my dad for uh, that powerful word. What I don't appreciate is how he set me up uh, tonight. <laughs> I don't know how to follow that, but we're going to do our best. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Uh, so good to hear the Southwestern uh, Christian College chorus. Amen. Did an outstanding job uh, tonight. We're going to get uh, into the text, Nehemiah chapter 4. Verses 13 and 14, and good to see all of my preaching comrades as well. Uh, and always good to know you have some support uh, in the audience. Uh, Nehemiah 4, verses 13 and 14, the Bible says, Therefore I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set the people according to their families with the swords their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord great and awesome. And fight for your brethren. Fight for your sons and your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Amen topic that I've been assigned tonight is entitled Swords, Spears, and Bows, Using Divine Resources When You're Under Attack. Right, right, right. Nehemiah 
whose name appropriately meant Jehovah consoles, writes his memoirs in the first person. He tells a story about himself and the Jews who were exiled in Babylon. The book of Ezra and Nehemiah actually go hand in hand with one another. They are separate books. However, early on, Ezra and Nehemiah were combined into a single unified work. Ezra was a contemporary of Nehemiah. These books, Ezra and Nehemiah, take place after King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire invaded Judah and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, taking a large number of the Jewish people into exile. The beginning of Ezra takes place approximately 50 years after the initial exile. One year after Persia had overtaken the Babylonian Empire. Nehemiah is serving in the Persian Empire as a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. The Bible lets us know that one day an Israelite named Hananiah, who is by all indication actually Nehemiah's brother, according to chapter 7, verse number 2, returns to Persia from Judah. When he comes, Nehemiah inquires of the well-being of the Israelites who had returned and he wants to know about Jerusalem. Hananiah tells him that the people in Israel are in great trouble. They are in great distress because the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When you go back to 2 Kings chapter 25 verses 1 through 10, we learn how the destruction of the walls of Jerusalem took place. In 2 Kings 25, we read about how in 586 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came against Jerusalem. They encamped against it. Jerusalem at this time was in a severe famine. There was no food in the land. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians have come into Jerusalem, broken down the city walls, burned the gates of the city with fire, then had a man by the name of Nebuzaradan, who was the captain of the guards, a servant of King Nebuchadnezzar, to burn down the house of the Lord, to burn down the king's house, and to burn down the house of Jerusalem. When that happened, this led the Jews who remained into the city remained rather in the city into Babylonian captivity. Now 142 years later, the Babylonian captivity having already ended, Nehemiah learns from Hananiah that the walls of Jerusalem were still burned down. When Nehemiah found out about the walls being destroyed, what happened in Jerusalem the Bible says in verse 4 of chapter 1 that Nehemiah began to fast, cry, and pray. He did this because he knew the significance of the wall. With the wall being down, that meant that those that had escaped were in Jerusalem but were under great distress. The wall was significant to Nehemiah. I know walls mean very little in most present day cities, but in Nehemiah's day, walls were very essential. Nehemiah knew that with the walls being torn down, that the people were in trouble. Because back in these times, in the ancient Middle East, the walls surrounded the city and its purpose was to keep the city protected 
to keep outsiders from coming in and destroying the people. They offered safety, safety from raids and symbolized strength and peace. And also the condition of a city wall was seen as an indication of the strength of the people's gods. So the ruined condition of the wall of Jerusalem reflected badly on God's name. Without the walls being up, the enemy has total access to the people, to their children, to their families, to their community, and it makes them and their God look weak. So Nehemiah cries because he knows how important the wall is. Nehemiah knew that something must be done. So he gathers a team, puts them together. They go and view, view the wall. He motivates them. And he says, the Bible says in verse 2, chapter 2, verse 19, let us rise up and build. And they set their hands to do this good work. They start building on the wall. But as always, when you start doing great works to better you and your people, haters, enemies, distractors, and detractors always show up when the people of God are trying to do a good work. Nehemiah starts building on the wall and the wall has been down for 142 years. Everyone has been content with the walls being down for 142 years. But now Nehemiah is coming working on the wall and here comes the enemies. Chapter 4 verses 1 through 3 the Bible says but it so happened when Sambalit heard that we were building, rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish? Stones that are burned. When we get to chapter 4, we see that they're building on the wall now. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, it's been quiet for 142 years. But all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Sambalit shows up to Nehemiah's building site. Sambalit had power. He had clout. He was a leading political official of Samaria. In a letter from Elephantine of Egypt, Sambalit was named as the governor of Samaria. So he has power. And out of nowhere, this powerful governor shows up to stop the wall. Can I tell you on tonight, church, that opposition is always around. They just don't show up until movement starts happening. As long as the church is stagnant, content, ain't teaching or preaching anything that's going to make a person change their life for the better, the church ain't doing nothing, the enemy is silent. But let movement start happening. They'll always show up and reveal themselves. The enemy is always on attack. Sam Ballard heard that the wall was being rebuilt and the Bible says that he was furious and became very indignant. In other words, he started acting ignorant on them. <laughs> He's acting the fool on them. He, he's upset. He's in his feelings because they're working on this wall and he knew how powerful the wall is and so he sees the wall as a threat to its influence in the area so he decides to speak against the wall. Sam Ballard attempts to counsel the wall. Sam Ballard's whole purpose and reason for being was to counsel the wall because he knew what the wall stood for. It stood for protection. It stood for purity. It stood for morals. It stood for godly principles. 
to have the wall up meant that just anything and anybody couldn't come up in here and destroy our cities, destroy our homes, destroy our families, destroy our values, destroy our teachings. To have the wall up meant you couldn't come up in here and teach any and everything to our children. So the whole purpose and goal was cancel the wall because the wall stood for something good. And can I tell you on tonight that we are living in a symbolic society right now. Our symbolic today is known as the cancel culture. Symbolic in this text tonight represents the cancel culture of today. Sam Ballard's whole purpose and goal was to counsel the wall so that he could stop the works of God so that he could come in and invade the people. And can I let you know that we're dealing with a Sam Ballard culture right now called the council culture. The church is under attack by the council culture. You stay or do or preach anything that the culture doesn't like, they'll counsel you. And they're never by themselves. They always have a flock that's following them. All they have to do is post post something to social media that I'm counseling the church for this reason. And thousands and thousands, millions and millions of people will counsel you, dislike you, say negative things about you, and you never met these people. But because somebody doesn't like your teaching and your values, they'll counsel you. This is why. This is why many preachers of today just preach prosperity, motivational, self-help, make you shout messages. Turn to your left and tell your neighbor that this is my season. My breakthrough is on the way. That's, that's the wrong neighbor. Turn to your other neighbor and tell your neighbor that this year you're going to be rich. You, you will not be broke. Money is coming your way. This is your year. Slap five people and tell them you will not get sick. You will not die. The devil is alive. You will prosper. I'm the head and not the tail. Tap two or three people and tell your neighbor that I'm coming out. I'm I'm coming out of this thing. I'm coming out. Your bank accounts will overflow. Your 401ks will double in size. You will get a pay increase on the job. You'll get a new house this year. You're going to get a new car this year. Somebody will drop a seed in your lap. But now this will only happen if you sow a seed of $100,000 to my ministry. Those are safe messages. And so because preachers know that that's all you want to hear. Because if I preach something where the wall is up, it's preaching righteousness. It's preaching godliness. But if I preach a message of prosperity and you're coming out, that's a safe message. And nobody will counsel me. No, no preacher wants to get counsel for preaching righteousness. That's against the culture. To preach righteousness, to preach against sin, is to build the wall back. And the world doesn't like the wall being up. It prefers it being torn down because that means that any and everything can be taught and accepted. And if you preach righteousness, if you preach against sin, we'll counsel you the Sandalic mentality. So walls have been torn down in the church. The church has become weak and all accepting to keep me from being counseled. In this same valley culture, preachers have to preach safe messages because people think that the church is here for what you can get out of it. So that's why when you tell them how to live or your lifestyle, your, 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 your culture is against God's word, 
suddenly the church and God is outdated and antiquated. But as long as I benefit from the church, I'm there. If you go to that church, they'll pay your rent. If you go to that church, you can improve your business. If you go to that church, you'll be important in that church. If you go to that church, you'll find a man, you'll find a woman. People want the experience without an expectation. But church is not here for what you can get out of it. It's here to help produce and provide and prioritize Jesus in your life. We think that the church is here for what we can get out of it. And if it's not a message that I like, if it goes against the culture, if it goes against what I think or believe, if I don't want to hear it, then I'll counsel you. It's a sad day, church, when the church begins to compromise, when we begin to go with the culture to make people feel good, to keep from being counseled. It brings tears to my eyes when the summation of the churches across America have gotten to the point that we want people to come so bad that we'll keep offering up a cheap meal. By meal, I mean a cheap gospel in order to keep people coming. Trying to make Christianity sound so fun and so appealing and so comfortable. But we don't want anybody to get upset. We don't want anybody to leave. So if we, if you don't like it, we'll change it. If that topic offends you, we won't talk about it. If it's not politically correct, we won't preach it. We'll serve up a Burger King Jesus. Well, you can just have it your own way. But if you're going to be a disciple, your relationship with God has got to stop looking for easy all the time. It's not going to be easy all the time. And the church cannot be more concerned about people being offended than it is about people being saved. What kind of church is it? That says if you don't like the hard lines of Jesus, we'll change it. What kind of church is it that says if you don't like that topic, we won't talk about it. It's a sad truth today that we have churches that will modify God's word because we don't want people to be offended. We don't want to be canceled. Sam Ballard tried to cancel the people of God. Listen, church. We got to keep the walls up. We can preach the word and not be dogmatic with our approach. Preach it, but after preaching it, give the people of God hope by showing them God's grace. And showing that Jesus came for this very reason. Although you may have issues in your life. Although you may have struggles in your life. I serve a God that's able to get you out of your struggle and out of your situation. We got to preach the gospel but give people hope. Sam Ballard knew the importance of the wall. So he does everything to cancel the wall because if I can destroy the wall, I can destroy the people. So he starts making mockery of the Jews in in verse 1 through 2 of chapter 4. The first attack is in the form of ridicule. The nature of council culture will mock you and will ridicule you to make you lose your influence and make you purposeless. So he mocks them and he calls them feeble. feeble. He, he says in verse 2, will they fortify themselves? In other words, how could a remnant, remnant of, of feeble Jews hope to build a wall strong enough to protect the city from his army? And he obviously didn't know their God. Because when you have God on your side, the impossible becomes possible. Sam Ballad, Tobiah, the Ammonites, and the Arabs couldn't understand it because they didn't have the same God that Nehemiah served. 
Sambalit is sitting back making mockery of the people but they didn't know that their God was going to show up and show out in a grand and mighty fashion he asked in verse number two will they offer sacrifices he says this because he's implying that it will make more it will take rather more than prayer and worship to rebuild the city in other words he was denying that God would be able to help them to get the wall up and to get the wall rebuilt. He says, he says, he says, will your God be able to help you get this wall up? Will these little feeble simpletons complete the wall in a day? Then Tobiah comes in the scene. There, here they are with one another, mocking the people of God. You think maybe they'll receive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned. What will they do, Tobiah? He's mocking God's people and he's mocking the wall that they're trying to build because he understands that if we allow this wall to be rebuilt, families will be impacted. And so they start making fun of them. But I love how Nehemiah responds. Verse 4 through 8, the Bible says that Nehemiah's first response when attacks came was to turn to God. His resource was first prayer. He started praying. And church, as we encounter spiritual attacks, we too must combat it through getting down on our knees and praying. Nehemiah, Nehemiah reminds God that his people are being despised. Nehemiah's prayers were not for him to fight his enemies, but for God to fight the enemies for him. In other words, he says, God, I'm going to do my part, which is continue to encourage your people to build the wall. But God, your part, I'm going to leave up to you because this ain't my fight, but it's your fight. See, church, when we learn on tonight that the battle is not ours, but it's the Lord's, when we finally learn that God has already won this thing for us, He's already taken care of our enemies for us and our haters for us. Can't nobody get us down from the wall because I know that the fight is already won. Amen. Nehemiah prayed. How much time I have? Five minutes. Nehemiah prayed. And he didn't allow himself to get detoured from his work by taking time to reply to his enemies. Nehemiah said, I've got work to do. Yeah, yeah. Nehemiah apparently motivated the people to work even harder. Yeah. He pushed them. He said, we can do this. Yeah. Remember our goal. Yeah. Remember our mission. Yeah. Remember our purpose. Yeah. Keep building while they're talking. And so they kept on building. Nehemiah said, you got to keep on building. Remember what you're fighting for. You're fighting for your freedoms. You're fighting for your families. You're fighting for your children. You're fighting for your people. He said, fight the good fight of faith. He said, we got to fight for our families. And in this fight, I need you to know that I've got some divine resources for you in the fight. You cannot just fight this fight by yourself, but you got to have some divine armor to fight the fight. In verse 13, he says, so what I've got for y'all, I've got a sword. I've got a spear and I got some bows. We got some armor for this fight. He says, I know you feel outnumbered, but don't be afraid of them. I want you to remember verse number 14. The Lord who is great and awesome. He says, there's no need to stop building, to stop fighting because we've got God on our side. And I want to remind somebody of that on tonight. You've got God on your side. Your enemy may have all the artillery, but you ought to tell somebody, but I've got God. 
You may have all the odds in your favor, but I've got God. You may have all the plans and all the strategies, but I've got God. You may have the carts on your side, but I've got God on my side. You may have money in the bank, but I've got God. You may have degrees behind your name, but I've got God. And the Bible says, if God be for me, who? I said, who? Who can be against me? And church, no matter what comes our way tonight, come hell or high water, come the council culture, come critics, come distractors, I want us to remember that we've got God. And as long as we've got him, if he be for us, who can be against us? If we have the sword, we can keep on building. For the sword is the offensive weapon that God provides for us. Back during biblical times, the Roman soldiers wore on his girdle a short sword, which was used for close-in fighting. That's what the Hebrew writer is talking about. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12 the Hebrew writer compares the word of God to a two-edged sword and that Greek word for sword really means a dagger which is a short sword which meant that you had to come in close to fight your opponent that's the word of God it's a sword it's a dagger because it's sharp and is able to pierce the inner man just as a material sword pierces the body. That's what God's word does. It cuts and convicts. Nehemiah said, when the enemy comes, pull out the sword. Pull out the word, in other words. And I want us to know that church, when the enemy comes, when he comes attacking us, what we got to do is go back to the word. The material sword pierces the body, but the word of God pierces the heart. The more you use a physical sword, the duffer it comes. But the more you use God's word, it only makes it sharper in our lives. A physical sword requires the hand of a soldier, but the sword of the spirit has its own power, for it is living and powerful. A physical sword wounds to hurt and kill, while the sword of the spirit wounds to heal and give life. I'm telling us, when the enemy comes, we got to pick up the sword. We know that the word of God will defeat the enemy every time. And if the church and if the home is ever going to gain back its spirituality, somebody's got to fight. Fight to keep God's church righteous. Fight to keep the church as being a place for sinners who feel like they have no hope and a place where hope really is. Fight to keep the church as being a place that when I leave the club, I can come to the house of God. That, that I don't come in the house of God and get a club experience, but that I encounter Jesus in the house of God. Is there anybody on tonight that wants to encounter Jesus? No, no, I said, is there anybody on tonight? As I go to my seat, is there anybody on tonight that wants to encounter Jesus? Is there anybody on tonight, I'm going to ask it one more time, that wants to encounter Jesus? I'm talking about Jesus, the one that can change my life. Jesus, the one that can make me whole again. Jesus, the one that has the power to make me put the weed down and pick the word up. Jesus, I'm talking about Jesus. Jesus, the one that has the power to turn a drug dealer into a deacon. I'm talking about Jesus, who is the pathway to salvation. Jesus, who is the key to knowledge. Jesus, the wellspring of wisdom. Jesus, the doorway of deliverance. Jesus, the pathway of peace. Jesus, the roadway of righteousness. Jesus, the highway of holiness. Jesus, the gateway of glory. Is there anybody that wants to know that man Jesus I'm talking about Jesus 
So you see, when you use the word of God on the enemies when they attack, it brings you back to Jesus. I'm talking about Jesus. The one that when I'm tired, he jubilates. Jesus, the one that when I'm weak, he innovates. Jesus, the one that when I'm lonely, he fascinates. Jesus, when I'm friendless, he obligates. Jesus, when I'm depressed, he alleviates. Jesus, when I'm in trouble, he conciliates. Jesus, when I'm moneyless, he donates. Jesus, when I'm hungry, he cultivates. Jesus, when I'm thirsty, he allocates. Jesus, when I'm homeless, he accommodates. Jesus, when the devil comes, he investigates. Jesus, when he shows up, he makes the devil vacate because Jesus is my delegator. And can I, can I reiterate, I'm going to tell somebody that we need Jesus. And it is the word of God when the enemy comes that brings us back to Jesus. Nehemiah said, all we need to attack the enemy is the sword. And church, when the enemy attacks the church, we've got to remember to go back to the sword. Go back to the word of God. And the word every time will make the enemy run. You remember Jesus in Matthew 4? Every time the devil came at him, Jesus always put the word back on him. He said, it is written. When the enemy comes to the church, we got to put the word back on him. Say, it is written. We got to build the walls again, church. That's my lesson to you. That's my lesson to you. I pray something was said that was helpful. You heard God's word on tonight. Amen. Amen. You've heard God's word. The question is, will you believe this message that God has given you? That it indeed is the word of God that the church has to get back to. Do we believe that? That the word of God can take care of our enemies tonight. Do we believe that it is his word and it's not the things of the world that would draw people to him? If we believe that, if you believe that, the question is, are you willing to change your ways? Are you willing to give your life to Jesus Christ? Are you willing to change your ways, which is repentance? If so, are you willing tonight to confess Jesus Christ to be the son of God? Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. If so, we'll baptize you tonight. You'll get to know that man, Jesus, that we talked about. You'll get to know him. You'll get to walk with him. You'll get to live with him. When you go down in the water and come up, you'll come up a new creation. God will add you to his body. You live faithful one day. He'll give you a crown of righteousness. That will never fade away. This invitation is yours as together we stand and sing the Savior's invitation. Lord, I just want to say thank you. Oh, Lord, I just want to say thank you. Lord, I just want to say thank you.
He worked. He worked. He worked. Amen. Now, we've had a great time in the Lord. And I've got to make a confession before all of y'all right now. I got a note of, a well, probably a long time ago. And if your car don't crank, you just come get me because it's my fault. Uh, left some lights on in a 12 passenger van. Hopefully you can get crunk. But you come get me if you don't get crunk. I hope I ain't got to take all 12 of you home tonight. But that's on me. That's on, that's, that's on me. Amen. <laughs> Have mercy on me. But we, we're, we're glad. Uh, Lord Tenney Hall Congregation, the leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. East Texas Empowered Ministries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we are just, uh, Brother John Dansby called me today, said pray for him and his travels. Hopefully he'll be here tomorrow. We said he had to be there with his wife. He didn't get to make it on yesterday or today, last night. So he just called me late last night. So when when the, the older gentleman's call that's been in on the battlefield a long time, guess what I do? I answer. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Hey, son, did I bother you? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. <laughs> And call me, call me, amen. Now, the sisters had a great time, didn't it? Y'all had a time down there. We let y'all get out of our sight for a little while and y'all just had a good time, amen. Amen. I was peeping in on you, though. But uh, we're just glad that, that you came our way and we're just glad that we were blessed once again. But making your notes, making your notes on tomorrow morning. At 9.15, instead of Brother Jeff Miller, it would be Brother Skippy Norm from the East Cotton uh, Church of Christ there in the city of Long Beach, Texas. Yeah. And then Brother Jeff Miller will uh, take Brother Norman's spot in the program on Thursday at 9.15. So make that notation if you would. And uh, boy, all the speakers have been good, hasn't they? Yeah. Woo! And they have uh, studied their lesson. If I don't know how to build a wall when I get finished up in here, it ain't nobody fault but mine. Yeah. Just have a few announcements while we get in the certificates. Once again, definitely an outstanding day to day. All Dennis have done just outstanding. Let's give him love to Father. Every last one of you an outstanding job. I appreciate all of them. I do want to make this announcement this evening on behalf of the Metroplex Bible Teachers Workshop. Mark your calendars for April the 20th, 2024. The Marcellus Avenue Church of Christ is the host yes. congregation. This is from Brother Raymond Hart. So definitely, if you want more information on that, you can see. Brother Raymond Hart, as it relates to that announcement. The numbers are moving up. Last night we were at 108. Let's give Brother Tim Banks. I know he don't necessarily feel like he needs credit, but the brother needs some credit. He's been keeping the count, and uh, we had one, 108 last night. We went up to 143 tonight. So, hey man, give yourselves a hand. We appreciate that very much, and definitely we can't say enough about Brother Tony Ruffin and Brother Christopher Morgan. Let's give them a love and a He has done a great job keeping all of the presenters and all the stuff that's been up on the screen as well. And I asked Brother Ruffin if he would go ahead and, and put that up on the screen, if he can, for the lectureship for it. There we go. So that everybody has an opportunity. This is where we're going, Lord's will, in 2025, San Antonio, Texas will be the Texas State Lectureship Ministry Impact Conference. We didn't have an opportunity to put it in the program booklet, but want to definitely make sure that you had it up on the screen. Delcrest Church of Christ will be the host congregation. Dr. Uh, Jerry Houston, and we're looking forward to having a great time as well. So let's keep him and the team, the congregation, everybody in prayer as they are working together to do this. I will turn it back over to uh, Brother Mark King for an excellent job. Yes. Amen. We want to give our presenters a certificate of appreciation tonight. 
And y'all wondering why I try to keep time real good? Because they don't want to pay me overtime. <laughs> Before you tonight because earlier today people had requested pledge cards so we have them tonight if you need a pledge card raise your hand and we'll make sure that we get this to you uh, we'll have them here tomorrow as well but I did not want anyone to leave tonight but ask for a pledge card and I was not able to accommodate you at that time Thank you so much. We've had a great time tonight. Amen. I am so blessed yes. to have been able to hear Amen. these two great men of God. Amen. 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 Follow me, he has set me free, oh, God has smiled on me, he's been good, so good to me, say it again, say God. smile on me yes he has set me free oh God God has smiled on me I know that he's been good to me let us pray Father in heaven Thank you for this father and son team yes, that has shared with us from your word. Amen. We thank you for all of the ministers and leaders that have gathered here. We thank you for the uh, congregation here and all those in the East Texas area Amen. who has made this these blessings possible. Dear Lord, now we just ask for traveling grace as we go home or to our hotels. We pray that you will bring us back safely again on tomorrow morning. Yes. Please forgive us of our sins and as much as we repent. We ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Once again, we want to thank you for joining us in our live stream worship service on today. We pray and trust that this service has been both pleasant and profitable for you. We pray that the next time we gather together, uh, at the North Turner Hall Church of Christ, we pray that you will come and be with us in person. We would love to have you. In the meantime, feel free to follow us on our Facebook page for all of our upcoming events. May the good Lord continue to bless you and your family and keep you in his care. That is our prayer. Amen.